I'm your surprise guest speaker. Um, I am Izzy Tolhurst, the Youth Media Centre Lead at the Foundation for Young Australians. And I'm really excited to take you through some research we did as an organisation in late 2020 about the media representation of young people during the early months of COVID in Australia. Before I begin, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land, the Darug people, and pay respect to elders past, present and emerging. This always was and always will be Aboriginal land. The Foundation for Young Australians are a national not-for-profit who believe that young people have the power to beat injustice and transform the future. Our role in that is to back young people with the skills, resources, connections and trust to make change. In the Youth Media Centre, I support young people to understand how to use media as a tool for advocacy, to help them understand the role the media plays in shaping the national debate and to work with them so that they understand how to detect and decode misinformation. We are campaigning for safe and equitable engagement with media. In the early months of COVID-19 in Australia, young people were hit particularly hard and we wanted to see if this was accurately reflected by the Australian media. The missing Young People in Australian News Media Report was launched in partnership with media, Meltwater Media Monitoring in October 2020 during Media Literacy Week. We chose this week because we, we regarded the findings as innately tied to media literacy and ability to understand bias, detect agendas, decode symbols and demand credibility in news media. A few things to call out on this research were some of the limitations. So firstly, the time frame and sample size of this analysis was quite small. While there was a large overlap, or there is a large overlap in online and print news, we didn't explicitly examine print media, nor did we explicitly examine broadcast media. So this is really an online news analysis. Secondly, this was a first undertaking of its kind for FYA. We had not done a media analysis before or research media. It was a pilot. Um, and as such, we recognise that some of the findings may not just pertain to young people, but also to other generations. Finally, this analysis does not consider how intersecting issues of class, race, culture, gender or socioeconomic imp uh, status impact representation in the media. These are all things we would like to examine in the future. Uh, Buttrose says millennial workers lack resilience and need hugging. Young people are so keen to raise climate change, but are deaf to COVID-19 danger. Older generation tell millennials to calm down and not panic. These are headlines that emerged from our analysis. Um, they, were, they were published between February 1 and July 31 of 2020. Um, and the reason I pulled these up on the screen today is because this is part of testing our own bias in this research. So we wanted as a youth organisation to understand if this was really how the media did treat young people or just be, was this something we'd assumed because we were always going into bat for young people. Here's how we went about testing this assumption. We established a baseline for understanding how young people are talked about by Australian online media. We searched online media for keywords or keywords about or words synonymous with young people and found that out of a total of 10 million articles published during this period, only 338,000 were about young people. That means that young people made up less than 3.3% of total articles in the first six months of COVID-19 in Australia. And despite being disproportionately impacted by COVID, articles about young people actually declined from 2019, down by 14%. And of the 2020 content, less than half of it was about COVID. From establishing an overview of youth representation in Australian online media, we were able to zone in and examine the articles published by six mainstream online news publications. We reviewed content by The Age, Australian Financial Review, the Australian, The Herald Sun, SBS and ABC. These publications were chosen for two key reasons. One, that they included some of the most widely accessed online news sites in Australia, um, based on search volume, and they provided an accurate depiction of the Australian media landscape. That is that we are in a me media duopoly, um, but we also thought it important to um, consider some of the public broadcasters or media services as well. In this analysis, we not only searched for the presence of keywords, but scrutinised where quotes appeared, um, how many quotes appeared, and how claims, particularly those made in the headlines, were substantiated by body copy or quotes or case studies in the text. This analysis revealed that across the six publications, as you can see on the slide, 59% of articles that mentioned young people in the headline were not supported by a case study or a quote in the body copy. 
So it became apparent to us at this stage that young people are routinely talked about and not to. To make matters worse, not only are young people talked about and not to, but by and large, stereotypes are used in um, reportage and coverage of young people. Stereotypes can impact public perception and how policies are made or not made for young people. And importantly, they also influence often how young people perceive themselves. So in this analysis, and, and this is where the small sample size, I guess, is an issue, but it still makes, the findings are still significant. Um, that when we analysed the 685 articles about young people across the six major news publications, we found that almost 50% of articles about young people included one of these negative stereotypes. The Australian used negative stereotypes in 75% of its coverage of young people, while the Herald Sun used negative stereotypes in 61%. With statistics like this, you begin to see a correlation between the use of stereotypes and young people's declining trust in media. Our research about the use of stereotypes supports the findings by Western Sydney University and Queensland University of Technology in News and Young Australians 2020, how young people access, perceive and are affected by news media, um, which found that 66% of young Australians believe that news media organisations have no idea about the lives of young people. Millennials, you can't unfollow a pandemic. This was one of the articles that emerged from our stereotype analysis and it depicted young people, it kind of ticked every box, <laughs> depicted young people as lazy, lacking resilience, entitled and unable to make the right decisions. It also didn't feature any youth voice or representation from the generation. And this was not just a problem for young people. Our analysis revealed that the media does change how they report on you based on your age. In this section, we used conventional generational tags, baby boomer, Gen X, Gen Y and Gen Z, to understand how coverage varies based on age. These tags cover the Australian population aged 11 to 74. And while that's relatively vast, we also recognise that these generational tags don't acknowledge the diversity that exists within the age brackets. For this issue analysis, we, review, we reviewed 518 articles across five key issue areas and broke it down by generation. We analysed for sentiment using a spectrum model and according to this criteria. Positive, where articles were favourable to a generation or included substantiated claims and quotes from members of the generation. Negative, where articles were critical about a generation and did not include quotes or evidence or case studies. And neutral, where articles were balanced, featured evidence and sources or quotes or case studies from a member of the generation. Neutral is particularly important here because this is ideally uh, you know, what news should be, objective and treating people free of bias. This is an example of our analysis in the area of economic wellbeing, where we can see that 71% of articles about Generation Z were critical of them and lacked quotes or case studies about them. Millennials came limping out of the Great Recession with massive student debt and crippled finances. Here's what the generation is up against if the coronavirus triggers another recession. To flesh out this methodology, here's an example of economic wellbeing article. It demonstrates that a classification of positive does not necessarily reflect a good news story about young people. Instead, what the article did was include voices and experiences of young people in the story via case studies and quotes. Uh, in the story, um, it also featured an image of the interviewee, of the young interviewee, and the journalist referenced speaking with dozens of people between the ages of 24 and 39 who shared stories of their struggles finding work and building long-term wealth. This is the kind of media coverage we are advocating for. Our report closes by making five key recommendations to improve media representation of young people. One, that newsrooms collect data on youth voice and representation. Two, that media include quotes from young people when they're publishing a story about young people, um, particularly when they feature in the headline. Um, recommendation three, that media or really anyone publishing content or news about young people should make use of intermediary organisations that exist in this country. So shout out for FYA there, but also for the YMCA at a national level and state and territory based peak bodies and councils. There are plenty of them who have extraordinary networks and access to young people. Recommendation four was to increase the number of employment opportunities for young people in the media. 
We would love to reimagine or support media to reimagine cadetships and internships, but we also recognise that media have been under enormous strain financially and resource-wise and politically, um, so that this has only been exacerbated by COVID. So we don't believe this to be a responsibility that's wielded alone by um, media, but we think it's a great way to lift representation. And recommendation five, and probably the most important one for here, is to start a conversation with us about how we further this research um, in its breadth and depth, and um, how do we make and how to make the media more representative. In future iterations of this research, we would like to examine new questions and approaches. Um, we'd like to lift from the baseline we've established, which has also become a mechanism for assessing how we work and how we work and deliver impact for young people across the country. This could include examining longer timeframes, as I mentioned, including broadcast and independent media, um, and looking at the role of imagery and photos in how they influence the public perception of young people. And we also hope that these recurring reports could help develop new tools that support increased media literacy and representation. So this might include something like a tracking mechanism for media, like a youth voices standard, uh, or it might be about creating, um, as Paul mentioned, a really important part of addressing media literacy and the spread of misinformation, more hyper-local media outlets where young people own and make the media with obvious and important intersections to existing infrastructure. That has been a real whirlwind tour of our quite lengthy report. If you would like to read it in full, it is available on our website, FIA's website. Um, and if you're interested in chatting about this research or furthering it, please get in touch. I'd love to hear from you. Thanks very much.